Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Elon this first Sunday in February and the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. We're glad that you're worshiping with us today. As we strive to walk more closely with God this Epiphany season through our study of the five essential practices of the Christian life, worship, study, service, generosity, and sharing. Each week we will begin our worship with two verses from Scripture that kind of cement these practices and help us understand them better. So you may want to think about memorizing these verses or read them every day throughout the week to root yourself more deeply in these practices that we're studying. And our scripture this morning will be read from home by Don and Joanne Johnson. Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, Running over will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And Acts 20, 35. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work, we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who Let's join together in our responsive reading for today. We will walk this day with you, O God, and you will walk with us, gathering us into a community marked by generosity and abundant sharing. We will walk this day with you, O Christ, and you will walk with us, calling us to follow you, helping us to set aside all which holds us back. We will walk this day with you, O Spirit, and you will walk with us. Open our hearts, open our hands, open our lives, so that we might give as you give. Let us join together in our prayer of confession for today. Your response will be quite simple. Hear our purposeful prayers, O oh God. Let's pray together. You are only as far away as the sound of our whispers will travel, Lord. Yet we so often struggle to speak with you intimately. We make small talk sometimes, thanking you for sun and rain, for gentle breezes and low humidity. Though we may be grateful, we know that chatting about the weather is something we do with casual acquaintances and even strangers. Hear our purposeful prayer, O oh God. We maintain substantial vocabularies, collections of words we use for term papers and inter-office memos and for texting our friends. But do we use them to deepen the conversation we have with you, O oh God? Hear our purposeful prayers, O oh God. Forgive us when we are shallow, 
seeking a quick blessing or a fast favor from you without being willing to invest fully in a trusting, committed relationship with you, letting you into parts of our lives but keeping you at arm's length in others. Forgive us when we are one-sided, always asking for mercy and compassion, but not returning the same. Hear our purposeful prayers, O God. Forgive us when we approach you begging for guidance and direction for our lives, but then neglect to follow your instructions. Forgive us when we cry out with our pressing questions, but then fail to truly listen for your answers. Hear our purposeful prayers, O God. May we please have another chance to appreciate the fullness of your love, May we try once again to shed our self-interest and find joy in serving your interests. Hear our purposeful prayers, O God. Amen. God not only hears our prayers, God answers our prayers. May we embrace God's purpose for our lives, for all that we are and for all that we have as forgiven and reconciled people. Amen. Let's spend a few moments with our children in worship today. Say hello to Emma and Brady Ritter and their mom, Julie. It is their turn to be with us for children's time today so that all of the other children in the church that are watching today, and really all of us because we're all God's children, can learn with Emma and Brady and Julie what they're here to share with us today about giving and generosity. Good morning, children. I brought some items today with me that you may or may not have seen before. The first thing that I want you to do is I want you to look at this. And I have, what is this, Emma? A water bottle. A water bottle. What would you say if I decided to try to drink the water before I took the top off of it? Would that make sense to do? No. It would not make any sense. You have to get the order right. It's very important if you want to drink the water. I also brought with me this morning some toothpaste and a toothbrush. Do you brush your teeth in the morning? Yes. Good. That's important to do. Now, what would happen if you brushed your teeth before you put on the toothpaste. Would that make any sense? No, not at all. That would not make any sense. It's important to make sure that you put on the toothpaste and then you brush your teeth. You have to know what comes first. I have a couple of other things with me. I have some batteries and I also have a light. And if it was dark, and you were in a hurry to get the light on, would it work to only bring the flashlight and not put the batteries in first? No. Of course not. That would not work. You have to put the batteries first or the light's not gonna shine. You have to know the order and the right order and what should come first. So now I have two more things with me. I have a cross um, and I also have a jar of money. And the cross reminds us of Jesus. And then here's our jar of money. Jesus told us that it was very important to get these in the right order if life is going to work right. If we put money first in life, we can end up in all kinds of trouble. Jesus said that it's very important to put God first and not to worry too much about money. He wanted us to make sure that we put these two things in the right order. So now what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to pray with me, please. So let's pray together. Dear God, Help us to always put you ahead of money or anything else in life. Thank you that life will work when we put you first. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Have you ever watched a pirate movie about pirates searching for lost pirate treasure? Or maybe you've watched a show on the History Channel about modern-day folks who are searching for treasure. There, there's one about an island off the coast of Canada that supposedly has some kind of pirate treasure buried there. There's another show on the History Channel about World War II gold stashed somewhere and folks looking for it, hoping to find it. Each of those shows and, and others about treasure hunts often have a few things in common. Lots of legends and lore, a few maps here and there, and the hope of finding that vast trove of treasure. Whether you have ever wanted to follow a map and get to that place where X marks the spot, it's easy to get caught up in the potential for a big find. And as amazing as it would be to dig up a treasure chest full of gold or fine and precious jewels, Scripture tells us to look at treasure a bit differently. In Matthew 6, 19-21, Jesus tells us, Don't store up treasures for yourselves on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, there's nothing wrong for looking for a treasure chest full of gold coins or jewels. Our reward as Christians for living a life of faith and trusting in God and obeying God is far greater than any earthly treasure could ever be. One tangible way that we can show our faith and trust in God is by trusting God with our finances, our treasure, however much that might be. When we give to God, what we're doing is we're saying we trust God with that money. So today, let's prepare our tithes and offerings with the mindset that we are honoring God with our finances and through our finances with our very lives. Trust God to use our offerings that we give to build his church, to make disciples, and to transform the world and us in the process. The address of the church and the address for online giving will be on the screen during the offertory.
You already heard our text for today from Don and Joanne, but they're short, so I'll read them again real quick to refresh your memory. From Luke 6, Luke 6, 38, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And from Acts chapter 20, verse 35, In all of this I have given you an example, that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today we're going to talk about a really important spiritual practice, and perhaps a very challenging one, that really does, when we practice it well, it really helps us walk more closely with God. We've talked about worship and prayer, talked about study, and about serving, and so today we're going to talk about generosity. Now, this may seem a little counterintuitive during a pandemic, as the economy in our country for the last year has struggled and continues to do so, and, and many of us, quite honestly, may be struggling right along with it. Businesses are still closing, reducing staff. Some of you may be living on a reduced income, or maybe due to the pandemic, your expenses are going up. But, but here's the thing we need to know. Jesus gets that. Jesus spoke more about money and material possessions than he spoke about worship and prayer and study combined. Because Jesus knew that those issues can be hard. He knew that it was much easier to get tripped up around issues of money and possessions than it is worship, study, and prayer. And, and when it comes to money and possessions, if we don't deal with them well, we can end up losing sight of God's intention for us when it comes to the proper place in our lives for money and stuff. Now, it, I think it's easy to kind of file worship, study, prayer, and service under the religious stuff file. We put it in this basket over here. It's religious. But then we take things like, like money and possessions and finances and we file them over here under worldly stuff. We put them in a totally different basket. And we, we, we let God speak to us about this stuff, the religious stuff. But when it comes to money and possessions and finances, we tend to, to listen maybe a little more than we should to what the world says and what others say about the role of these things in our hearts and in our life. And, and really what we should do is take all of it and put it together in the same file, in the same basket. And label that basket not religious or worldly, but God's. <laughs> because it is truly all God's. And, and we tend to like to let God into our heart just fine, but we struggle to let God into our wallet. But what if we let God truly into all of it, into all parts of our lives? And, and, and I can honestly say it's taken me a while to learn to do that and learn how to do that, to really put it all together under belongs to God and to let God speak to not just my heart when it comes to worship and study and prayer, but to let God speak to my heart around issues of money and finances. And it's something I can honestly say I think I'm still learning and still trying to get the hang of it. I suspect we all are. But this is really a good time of the year to be talking about generosity and finances and money because if you're like me, you already are or very soon will be working on your 2020 income tax return. Right? Anyone else knee deep in all kinds of numbers? Yeah. But the thing is, you can really tell a lot about a person by looking at their tax return. It is kind of like a, a financial selfie, but without all the cool filters that make it look pretty. For example, people, people who tend to be generous with their charitable giving, and you can see it on their income tax reform, they're people who choose to live below their means. It's a choice. They do that to free up money to give to charity, and they're, and they're not spending all their money on themselves. But rather, their tax returns show that they are clearly thinking of others. 
it shows with the level of generosity and charitable giving that, that they report in those numbers. But folks living above and beyond their means or folks who are living right at their means, their tax returns show, by and large, they are much, much less likely to give to charity. And, and when they do give, it tends to be a much, much smaller percentage of their income. But that's telling because I, I think the thing is that, that what we do with our money those numbers, they, they tell us something important about the condition of our heart. Jesus knew that well, and he expressed it when he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. They, they go together. And our tax return can be revealing about where our heart really is. Now, my accountant, I've used the same person the last several years, and, and he always wants all my tax stuff around Valentine's Day. It's almost always, he says, return by, January, or by February 14th. So what that means for me is January is tax time at my house. So last Friday and the Friday before that, and today is Thursday, so tomorrow is Friday, so tomorrow too, guess what I'll be doing? I'll be running numbers. I have taken over the spare bedroom with, with piles and stacks of W-2s and bank statements and pay stubs and credit card receipts medical bills, other receipts, paper, paper, and more paper, my church giving statement, all that stuff. It's just all over the room. Paul does not cross a threshold. He does not go in that spare bedroom for fear he might move something or mess something up. He won't go in there until everything's all done and put away. And so to meet that Valentine's Day deadline, I have to organize all this paperwork that my accountant needs. He, he sends me a tax organizer every year. This year is 36 pages long. And I have to, the first, like, third of it, two-thirds of it, they're yes or no questions. There's almost 20 pages of yes or no questions. And then the rest of it is all kind of fill in the blank, but that's where i got to put in all the numbers and stuff. And, and then I take that to him, and he takes all those yes or no questions and all those numbers, and he magically does something really cool with them to make them say what they're supposed to say and do what they're supposed to do. So I know what I'm supposed to do. And then I write him a check in appreciation for him doing that for me because I'm not good with numbers. And then I either write another check to the IRS or I wait for the IRS to send me a check. I mean, you all probably know the drill, right? Some of you may do your own taxes. You may do them online. But you still have to look at that data. You have to look at those numbers from the previous year. You have to look at where your money came from, but then you got to look at kind of where it went and you get to see what you spent it on. How does it make you feel when you do that? Do you feel regret? Oh, why did we spend so much money on that? Oh, my gosh. Or maybe you look at your tax returns when they're all said and done, and you feel confusion. How on earth did we spend so much money on this? I, I, I don't know how we did that. Or maybe you feel frustration. Oh, we should have done better with this. Why didn't we spend more money here and less money there? Oh. Or maybe your, your income and your expenses are just completely upended by the pandemic. They're nothing like they were last year. And maybe it makes you feel anxious. Or maybe angry. Possibly you look at it all and you feel quite hopeless. Or maybe, just maybe, you look at your finances over the last year, what you did with your money, where it went, and maybe you feel a sense of satisfaction. Maybe you feel fulfillment. You feel good about that. Maybe you even feel joy. I don't know if I can use joy and taxes in the same sentence. I don't know if that's allowed. But maybe that's how you feel. You feel good about, about the choices that you made over the last year, about how you spent your money. And you feel good about what, what God enabled you to do with what God entrusted to you when it comes to your finances. I remember way back in 1996 when I graduated from Duke Divinity School and I got my first grown-up job. I mean, I, I did, you know, um, did campus work and babysat when I was in high school, but this is like a real job job, you know? And I was a pastor of a small church. I was only quarter time, didn't make a lot of money, but we both had student loans. 
from undergrad and from Duke. We had credit card debt. We had car payments. We got by, barely, but, but we did. And, and just a little bit of information for those of you who don't know, in the United Methodist Church, when it comes to pastors and taxes for tax purposes, we're considered self-employed. So our employer, the church, does not automatically set aside or take money out of our paycheck for taxes like a lot of other jobs do. We're supposed to do that ourselves. And then we make quarterly estimated tax payments. And I know that now. But back then, this whole grown-up adulting thing, especially when it came to money, it was all new to me. I didn't know all that. I didn't have a clue about taxes or being self-employed or how that all worked. So we did what grown-ups are supposed to do. We took all our paperwork to an accountant that we knew in one of our churches, and he did our taxes, ran the numbers, and he gave them back to us, and we owed the IRS like $864. We were shocked, and we were scared. We didn't have $864. We had no idea where we'd get $864. We panicked, we worried, we stressed. I cried. I distinctly remember crying about this. But where this money was going to come from? How are we going to do this? And, and what this all tells me now, in hindsight, is that we had not done a good job at all when it came to making decisions about what to do with our money. We were not spending it wisely, we were not managing it well, and we, we weren't saving any of it at all. And, I'm ashamed to admit, we weren't tithing. And not only were we not tithing, which is giving 10% of your income, we weren't giving anything that first year. Nothing, zero. Here, God had given us these churches, given us these amazing ways to serve him, to get paid to do it, And we gave nothing back to God for that, not a thing. We took 100% of what God had entrusted to us, and we spent all of it, every last penny, on ourselves. That wasn't smart. But I have learned since then a few things. Now, 25 years later, things are different. I actually feel good about taxes and tax time when I look at those numbers. I do. And it's taken a long time to get there, to lose that sense of panic and fear and frustration and move to a place of peace and a place of fulfillment when I look at those numbers. And my income has increased. That's good. And I'm much better at saving than I used to be. And after years of hard work, I don't have any debt. And not only am I able to tithe to the church that I love, I'm actually able to give beyond a tithe because I feel that that is what God is calling me to do. And I also make plans to give beyond that, to give to things that matter to me. And and those are choices I have learned to make. I don't stress about finances the way I used to, but it took me a long time to get here. A lot of fits and starts, a lot of two steps forward, one step back. But most importantly, what it really took is for me to embrace and apply in my own life and in my finances what the Bible says about how we are supposed to use our financial resources and why we're supposed to do that. So let's talk for a few minutes about that. Let's start with that why. Why should we be generous? Why why give? Well, first, when we are generous, our giving to God is a sign of gratitude. It is an act of thanksgiving for all that God has done for us, for all that God has given us. Our tithes and offerings, they're a way to say thank you to God. And, And I mean, if you like to write thank you notes, go ahead and write a thank you note to God for all God has done for you, and it'd probably be a very big, very long note, but where are you going to send it? For me, the way that, that I say thank you, my thank you note to God, one of those significant ways is by putting money in the offering plate or giving online. Another way I do that is I 
fill the blessing box. I try to make sure to do that every month, to sign up and take a turn. And, and these are things I do because I enjoy doing them, and they bless others, but, but they're a way for me to show gratitude to God, first and foremost. And second, giving is a tangible way that we can show our trust in God. You see, if I trust money to provide for my needs, then I'm going to be really concerned about the amount of money I have or don't have. And I better hold on to the money I have tightly if, if it's supposed to take care of me. But the thing is, money doesn't actually care about me at all. But God does. And if I trust that God will provide for my needs, then, then money becomes a whole different thing. It becomes a tool that God uses. And, and then I can understand that this money isn't my money, it's, it's God's money. And, and if that's the case, then I don't have to hold on to it tightly. I can trust that no matter how much or how little money I have any moment, God will take care of me because God cares for me. And I can begin to see money as a tool that God uses to provide for me, but then I can also see money as a tool God entrusts to me to care for others in his name and for his glory if I'm willing to let go of it and trust God with it. And third, God is generous. God gave us all of creation to enjoy. You cannot touch or taste or smell or see a single thing that God did not give to you. And God gave us Jesus, best thing he ever gave. And the Holy Spirit, also God's good gift to us. God gives us family and friends and food. And, and Scripture tells us, way in the first chapter, that we are made in the image of God. We are made to be like him and to manifest in the world God's character, God's nature. And God's nature is generosity. God's character is giving. And so when we are generous, when we give, we are living more fully into that image of God in which we were made. We walk more closely with God. Our lives align more closely with his and we become more like him. And fourth, we give so that we can invest our resources and our lives in things that truly matter, things that will outlast us. When I die, is it really going to matter if I'm wearing the latest Apple Watch or not? No, it's not going to matter a single bit. Is it going to matter when I die if I had a fancy car or expensive clothes? Not really. But if I invest my resources in the lives of people instead of just in material possessions for myself, then I'm investing in, in kingdom stuff. Things like making disciples and feeding the hungry and spreading the gospel, providing for my neighbors near and far. And when I do that, then, then lives are changed. The world is changed. And through that process, I am changed. All because I give. People are different and the world is different because I was a part of it. My life meant something. Investing in kingdom things outlasts me. I want my life to have that kind of impact through my giving. So that's why we give. That's why we are generous. And the second question I want us to think about is, all right, if, if we believe that and we want to be generous, we want to give, then, then how do we do that? How do we nurture generosity in our own lives? How do we become giving people? The first step is to simply be grateful for what you already have. Appreciate the things you have. Appreciate your family. Don't focus on their shortcomings or, or what they're not, but thank God for who and what they are. And the same goes for our stuff. Be happy you have what you have. Now, th this is an iPhone like 6. This is old. Like, I've had, I'm way out of contract in this phone. But um, I've thought a lot about, over the years, getting a new phone. 
And I could have got an iPhone 7, but I didn't. I could have got an iPhone 8, but I didn't. And now they're like, what, iPhone 12 Pro Max or something? Don't think I didn't think about it. But in the long run, I decided, you know, as long as this old iPhone 6 still works, and I can still get on the internet, and I can check my email, and I can call and text people, it does what a phone should do. I really, I don't need a new iPhone. I, I really don't. Because you know what happened if I get an iPhone 12 just because I want it? They're going to come out with an iPhone 13. And then a 14. I would get the 14, they're going to come out with a 15. And then I'm going to keep buying new iPhones every time they put out a new one. Because I'm driven by a want. And I decided, you know, rather than tie up my money in iPhones, I'd rather tie up my money in people. And free up that money to do things that bless other people. When my iPhone breaks or doesn't work anymore, then, yeah, I'll get a new one. Maybe it'll be an iPhone 22 by then, I hope. <laughs> but I try not to feed that desire for more, 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 and better, better, better. We all have places we're vulnerable for that. For some it's technology, for some it's a car, for some it's clothes. We probably all have our place where we struggle with that. But it's like a, fighting a losing battle we'll never win because until we possess everything there is to possess, we always could have more. We could want more, desire more, and chase after more. That's why it's important to back up and be thankful for what we already have and practice gratitude and appreciation. We practice gratitude as the foundation of generosity because if we appreciate what we have, we are less likely to spend, spend, spend more, 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 and that frees up more resources to give, give. And second, we can nurture generosity by choosing to live purposefully. What adds meaning to our lives? What gives us fulfillment and a sense of purpose every day? It's not my iPhone. <laughs> Is it the latest tech toy? Is it wearing the most current fashion, owning the sweetest ride, or living in the biggest house? Hopefully, as Christians, what gives our lives purpose and meaning is, is following Jesus Christ and living our lives for him choosing to live the way he calls us to live, the way that he will help us to live through his Holy Spirit if we ask him to help us, giving generously in ways that show compassion and caring for others and for the world around us. And third, to nurture generosity, to practice generosity. Do things that are intentionally generous. We, we give corporately as part of the church in ways that enable us to pool our resources and do a whole lot more together than we could each do individually with those same resources. But also think about what it means for you and the places you go and the things you do and the people you interact with to be generous in those, those places, those ways. I mean, if you go out to, to eat or if you have DoorDash delivered, tip generously. What would it mean to tip beyond 20%? Because you're trying to bless the person who delivered your food or you want to bless the waiter or waitress who brought your food. I mean, they're really struggling right now. Imagine how grateful they will be if you tip generously and how good you'll feel and how much more like God you'll be if you can manifest even those small acts of generosity. And, and look for ways to use your resources through other ministries in the church beyond just what you put in the offering plate. Things like the Blessing Box or Morrowtown or Zoe Ministry. And you'll hear more about Zoe during Lent because this week we were just assigned our community that we're going to work with of orphans. It's so exciting. So there'll be ways to do some things with Zoe Ministry. Be generous there as well. And just be attentive in, in e-notes in our newsletter about ways you can give. Things like crop walk. When is that? How can you be part of it? Or when Methodist women ask for school supplies, go get some and bring them. You can always give to First School, our preschool program here. They're always in need of scholarships and funds for snacks or supplies. Get some friends together and commit to a mission project together to make flood buckets or agape boxes or something like that. Or just send a check periodically to Ally Churches, Salvation Army, Piedmont Rescue Mission, or UMCOR. The list is truly endless 
a ways that you can individually practice generosity to make giving a way of living. And there's one final question I want to tackle today. Just it's talk about it for just a, a minute. What happens when we give? What happens when we make generosity toward God and toward others a habit? Winston Churchill said it best when he said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. And it's not that we give to Jesus in order to get back, like I give God a dollar and God gives me a dollar fifty, so I come out ahead of the deal. That's not how that works, to give to God to make money. That's not it. Rather, there, there's something about giving that, that blesses the giver beyond money. Generosity and giving bring joy. They really do. And they give our lives a sense of deeper meaning and purpose. The world is different. People's lives are different. And we, we are different when we practice generosity. When we are generous, we live more fully into the image of the God that we worship and study and serve. Let's pray. God, in your word in Psalm 103, you tell us, that you don't treat us as our sins deserve. And we're really glad you don't. We celebrate your absolute and complete unfairness, God, because you don't give us what we deserve. You answer our unfaithfulness with generosity. You don't repay our betrayal with vengeance. You never stop loving, even when we give you every reason to stop. You give us every possible chance, and then still more, to start again. But our story doesn't end there. You invite us into the life of faith where your impossible grace becomes the standard for our living. As such, we pray for your company as we try the things we fear most we can't do. In the silence, we name the people it is impossible for us to forgive. And we ask you to walk with us in the journey to grace. We name the people we know we have no right to ask forgiveness of. And we ask you to walk alongside them with your compassion. We name the situations that have no resolution that we can possibly imagine. And we pray that will not stop us from always choosing love. Your ending is always and only love. May we live to make that the world's ending too. And Lord, as your people, we gather our voices together and pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated.
Uh...